Hello, hello, everybody. Hello to everybody all over the world that is watching us. Welcome to this Family Health 360 webinar. And if this is your first time, welcome. If this is your fourth time, because there have been four, four runs yes, already, four then times. welcome as well. Welcome to everyone watching across the world. We are so thrilled to be with you all. And as we get started, let's get to know you. We have a poll that we want to share with you all. So if the team can just pop open that poll. Please answer these questions from wherever you are. And we'd love to see where, who you are, what your stage is, especially when it comes to this topic that we will be covering today with our amazing guest speakers. So there are three questions you guys should be seeing on your screens. How is your relationship with your own children? That's a big one. Don't worry, this is anonymous. We will not see your names. It's just a poll. Please start keying that in. And we're seeing you guys responding. That's amazing. The second question is, how good of a role model was your own father? Mm. Wow, these are big, big, question. loaded yeah. questions. And I, I feel a little emotional just thinking about all of these because I've had my own journey, both as a son and as a father. The third is, do you feel you have a father's heart wound from your childhood? Can you say boom? Boom. <laughs> That's a big one. Uh, please be honest. Once again, this is anonymous. No one will see your name, but we will see the poll. So here it is. Everybody, we have uh, several close to 500 people already watching from all over the world and it's just uh, if you're seeing what i'm seeing it's it's literally um uh iterating and what we're seeing right now is people are generally saying about 53 percent are saying yeah, my relationship with my kids are good yeah. the second one is excellent that's great maybe people are just too embarrassed to admit be honest guys remember this anonymous um but yeah we have some people who are honest and saying not too good average some are honestly saying it's poor. So thank you for being honest. The second role model of your own father. Wow. Okay. This is, this is where it's very real and honest. We're seeing good is about only 40%. And the, the, the next would be average. And then we have poor. So thank you for being honest, everyone, from where you're watching all over the world. And, you know, as you guys are, are doing this and answering those questions, uh, we want to remind you that we have the option to hear this in either Chinese, Mandarin, or Japanese. So if you're watching this on Zoom, you can click that option on the lower right of your screen beside leave. Please don't click leave. <laughs> Instead, click that interpretation so that you might hear this in your language. And I believe our amazing translators are also putting the poll questions in our chat box on the right. So you might be able to see that and also answer in your own language uh, if you'd like to put that on the chat box so that we might know. Um, the third question, do you feel you have a father's heart wound from your own childhood? And we're going to have a speaker unpack this a little bit more. Some of you are saying, well, most of you, 38% are saying yes, mildly. Thank you for being mm. honest. The next majority are saying no, fortunately. But the other two big ones, yes, badly, is 13%. And I'm not sure is 14%. Those that aren't sure, you're in the right place because one of our speakers, again, will unpack that. So welcome to everybody again. If you've just joined us, you're watching this either through a live stream or through Zoom. If you're on Zoom, there is a poll asking a couple of questions. Please chime in. We'd love to get to know your responses as we get started. I love that it's honest too, right? Because that's why we're all here to learn to grow and we're all in process. We're all in, on a journey. And I think we've this is the fourth this is the fourth webinar that we've had the privilege of hosting with Family First Global. And to be honest, it's been such a blessing to educate myself because we also learn mm. from the amazing speakers, areas where we need to improve and to grow in our own parents. So what are you excited to learn from this? I mean, because I'm a dad, yeah. uh, you know, so I can, I can totally see how this will be relevant for me. Um, what are you looking forward to? And maybe you can speak to some of the moms well, and the, the ladies that are watching this call as well. First off, I'm excited for you to learn stuff. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably why they're here. That's probably why I'm they're excited here. Too. Because I know it's going to it's going to benefit our marriage, our family, our children. So I'm going to take notes, not so much to say, babe, you should be doing this. Are you saying I'm not a good father? No, you're a great oh, father, but, but there's always room for improvement. There is for always all room of for us, improvement. Right? But I'm excited because I feel like as a wife, my role is 
as we hear about the principles and the roles and the encouragement from the speakers, then my job is to, as a wife, to pray for you in those areas and to also encourage you when I see you living those things out to say, babe, you know, I really appreciate that you do that, making such a difference in our family. So I think that's the role that we as wives can can play. I think it also manages expectations, right? Because when you know what a father should be doing, mm -hmm. then you can also gauge what kind of expectations you should have also. Maybe some wives here are, you know, have misunderstood it this whole time. Yeah, and I think for all of us, I think what we're also looking forward to, right, honey, is we're all children. We've all yeah. had fathers and we don't know what your journey's at and where you've been mm -hmm. as far as your father and your experience is being concerned. So we're excited for all of you and all of us Let's jump right into it. Are you ready, baby? I'm excited and I'm ready. I'm especially excited because one of the speakers is somebody that I admire so much. And we'll I, save course, that. I admire both of them, but one of them is my father. <laughs> so I'm excited about that. And in many ways, mine too. And yes. we'll talk about that in a little bit. So again, to everybody that's joined us, welcome for wherever you're watching around the world. It is a privilege to be with you all. It's, it's jumping up. The numbers are, are breaking now close to 700s. Mm -hmm. And so we want to give you some practical things as we get started we want to remind everybody once again there is an interpretation feature on the lower right if you are on zoom so you can listen to this particular webinar in either mandarin or in japanese so once again thank you for joining us uh, from wherever you are now you also will be receiving a, a link that has a recording of this whole webinar so that's the good news if in case you come in a little later or you want to be able to share that as well as the notes or the slides from our presenters, you'll be able to get that at the end. Um, but if you really feel you know, inspired by something you saw on your device, go ahead, take a screenshot. This webinar is for you. So one last very important reminder, because this, is, this webinar is indeed for you, please take this opportunity to ask questions. Mm -hmm. Many of you that might've been following even our own socials when we were promoting this said, hey, Please ask questions because that's why you're here live. That's the privilege you have. You can put it on the chat box if you're on Zoom. If you're on Facebook, put it there and the team will relay to us these questions and will help filter because there's quite a bit. We can't promise that all your questions will be answered, but you promise to answer as many as the speakers and we have time to do. So please do that. Send it on the chat box. Send it as early as you want so that it can be read and seen. Um, and now as we've said those practical announcements, Let's go, baby. Let's welcome them for Yes. So first, we just want to recognize that Family First Global is the host for this amazing webinar. And FFG, Family First Global, really exists to strengthen fathers and mothers, marriages and families around the globe. The globe. And um, they partner with like-minded organizations to help men and women become better spouses and parents in the context of traditional marriage and family. So Family First Global represents all chapters around the world from the Philippines, Indonesia, Singapore, Pakistan, Japan, and Myanmar. And they are the proud co-hosts of today's event. So I just want to give a shout out to all our fellow Pinoys out there who are joining us. You know, if you are there, please chat where you guys are all from. We'd love to see that on the chat. And if you are zooming in from any of these member nations, these locations, please do not hesitate to contact um, these chapters because they exist to help you build a stronger family right now so the webinar series as i was opening up earlier is called family health 360 and what is it designed to do it's designed to help journey with you through the waves of all the uncertainty that's happening around us and prepare us for the challenges ahead we've had three webinars already as we mentioned part one was held back in january and it was entitled navigating your family through the pandemic and the second part was in March, which talked all about preparing our family for economic challenges, where we had money conversations with some amazing guest speakers. Part three was in May, and it was all about raising a resilient generation, a big one as well. So we're very excited that a May webinar focused on moms. And this time around, we have dads. Dad. So yeah. for this one, we're excited to have uh, two amazing fathers, and they're going to speak about becoming the father you always aspired to. To be so as i said earlier and as joy said please feel free chat away where are you viewing from on the chat box and please feel free to start asking your question about fatherhood becoming the father you always aspired to be mm -hmm. as you're doing that 
Let's now get started with the program formally and our speakers to introduce our guests. We have the founder and chairman of Fellowship of Fathers Foundation and Family First Global or FFG, the global best-selling author of Be a Better Dad Today and a teacher of leadership courses at some of the finest business schools in the world. I consider him a mentor as well, whom I look up to. Ladies and gentlemen, let's please welcome the gentleman on your screen, Professor Gregory Slayton. Well, thank you so much, Edric, and thank you, Joy. Don't you just love our MCs? I mean, they are the best. So we're really thankful to you guys. And I want to just say thank you to everybody who's taken time out of your day to log in and join us. Because that tells me that being a good mom, being a good dad, and having a strong family is important to you. And that's where everything starts. Everything starts with your goal. Let me just tell you guys, I know a lot of very rich guys in Silicon Valley who have ruined their families. That's a bad trade. You become a billionaire and your kids hate you and your first wife despises you. It's a bad trade. All right, guys, so let's really focus. And I'm so thankful we have great speakers. But before I introduce our first speaker, a dear friend and a wonderful brother, let me just thank all the Family First Global chapters around the world who have helped make this successful, our tech team, the fabulous speakers, our MCs. And let me give a shout out to a couple of new, new team members, new partners that we have. Isaac TV is one of, if not the largest broad, Christian broadcaster in Urdu in the world. And they are live streaming this program right now. So we want to say hello and welcome to the many, many thousands, hundreds of thousands of people that are watching on Isaac TV. We say hello to you and we bless you in the name of the Lord. We're super glad you're with us. Thank you. We also want to say hello to some of our newest partners in India. We have some great partners there. We want to say thank you to them. Uh, doing a great job. We're looking to uh, form a strong partnership in India and as well as Poland and Ukraine. And we want to give a shout out to our new partners in Poland, new partners in Ukraine. And let me just say there are people from over 60 countries on this call, over 60 countries. If you're interested in from your nation in becoming part of Family First Global, look it up. If we're already in your nation, then please get in touch with the Family First chapter in your nation. If not, send us the, you know, send us an email. Go to familyfirstglobal.org, send us an email because we're here to serve. We are a Christian nonprofit service organization and we serve everyone, all families. So in, in, in Indonesia, we have a fantastic chapter in Indonesia and they serve a lot of Muslim families, a lot of Buddhist families, a lot of Hindu families, and that's good because we know that God loves every single family. We also know that every single person here that's joined us, all 800 plus people, and all the people on Facebook Live, thousands, we have a heavenly father who loves us and wants to help us be the very, very best dads we can be. So on that note, I'm going to introduce a dear friend. Casey Karstens has founded a number of successful fatherhood organizations. I love him because he's, he's just, he's a guy who's out there, right? And that's something I think we need to be people of faith. We need to be out there, right? And Casey certainly has, well, he's walking the talk. He's talking the talk. He founded World Needs a Father, which is a fabulous organization in over a hundred nations around the world. He's written a number of best-selling books of which I have read and benefited myself. And he's just also a humble guy. And I love that about Casey. He's done so much, he's accomplished so much, but he's a humble man. He's a good father, a great role model to many. Casey, we are super honored to have you on this call. And let me turn it over to you because I know that we're all gonna be blessed and benefit from your remarks. Thank you so much, Gregory. What a joy to be with everyone. And uh, we've got a 15 minutes to share some essential. I wanna share a PowerPoint with you so that we can run through a few absolute essentials. Many people aspire to be a great father, but they don't have the information on how to be a great father. And the, one of the informations that they lack is the needs of children. If we look at the fatherless condition of this world, then we see a massive detrimental impact of that. 
We first see this in the social pathologies when we look at addictions, crime, suicide. I know there are a, a, a huge number of suicides in, in the eastern part of the world, mass shootings in probably the western part of the world more. Then we see the impact and the effect of fatherlessness right there in our face on the newspaper. But what we often do not see is the detrimental effect if we do not meet the needs of the children in their personal lives, cognitively, emotionally, socially, and obviously spiritually as well. And it is very important that we study that so that we see what would be the impact of not only what we are doing, but what we neglect to do. And therefore, most people carry what we say father wounds, and uh, so many people are not conscious of it. And the only the first person to get conscious of that would be your spouse, seeing that something is wrong that she cannot put a finger on. But most probably, that would be a father wound or a mother wound that you carry. So where do these deep detrimental impacts come from? From the unmet needs of children. Let me show this to you. Children, as they grow up, they have certain specific needs at specific window periods or, or times in their lives. For instance, before birth and shortly after birth, babies need intimacy. And the impartation of that by mothers cannot be replaced actually by fathers because the secretion of oxytocin is high in the mother and also in the baby if they really connect. And then the nurture and care, when they start to walk, they fall a lot and then they must be taken care of. Uh, by the hug of the mother, the consoling of a mother, so the nurture and care of mothers are essential. But today it's about fathers. So what do the fathers contribute? And this is absolutely essential that you understand that they contribute specific things at specific times. First, that's emotional security. And it is absolutely essential throughout, but vital in those early years in support of the mother. And then secondly, it is the establishing of moral authority. So it is the child that must be able to discern between right and wrong, and father plays a very specific role in that. Shortly after that, between six and eight, that is the period of time where the self-worth concept of a child is formed, and therefore that affirmation of a father, father putting the child on his shoulder, so to speak, and say, you are great, you are good, you have a significant contribution to make in life. And then later on, towards the teenage years, yeah, by 10 and 11, then the identification uh, to, to, to form your own understanding of who you are. So the father confers identity in those years. Now, if we do not know that, we may miss that window opportunity and carry on in life and that leaves our children with wounds, with father wounds, with mother wounds that they carry, and the impact of that is seen later on in life. So for today, there are four things that I want to encourage fathers to focus on and give attention to. Firstly, children need emotional security, which the fathers provide, absolutely essential. When we look at this slide, we see that the fastest development and growth of any human being is in the first three and a half years of his life. And now what we have learned from the neuroscience is, if you do not have a stable, emotionally secure environment, then you cannot optimize in your performance. And then the child is inhibited and restricted and launched in life on a lower trajectory than the child would have been if given that emotional stable uh, situation or environment. So the first important thing of a father is environment. I always say that the father is the air conditioning of the house. You determine how it feels in the house and that is absolutely essential. So how do we create this environment? The first thing is that we must be so conscious of the brain body system of your children. They're right in the center of the brain of the child is his emotional brain. And the first thing that you've got to ignite, switch on, is that emotional brain. Now, sometimes fathers think, you know, the only way that children learn is you send them to a good school and they get good schooling and they get knowledge and then they will perform well in love. I'm sorry, but all the research is proving that this is not the best way. Knowledge is important, but emotional intelligence far outweighs knowledge in success as a success indicator for life. 
And therefore, the fathers must be conscious of that central part. They must ignite a great positive feeling in their children. How do we do this? Because we want to be really practical in our short time as well. This is how we do this. You come home you with joy and excitement and your face shows, I want to be with you. And then, hello, my children, they run towards you. If your face is good enough and welcoming enough, they run towards you and you give them the big hug. And as you hug them, the secretion of oxytocin, which is that bonding neurotransmitter, is secreted and they hug and, and that sets them up well. Then you say, oh, we are going to have the greatest of time together. And when you say that in the brain of the child, dopamine is secreted to make, give them that excitement of the time to come. And then you say, oh, it is so great to be here. When you say that, that calming effect of serotonin kicks in and the child says, oh, the best time of my day is when daddy comes home. Can I just say the opposite? If you come into the house and you are shouting at them, do your homework, and your, your room is not tidy, and five minutes of stress stops the secretion of immunoglobulin A for six hours, which means the immune system of your child is impaired. It increases the secretion of cortisol means your child cannot think clearly when he has to study. So some of us do not even know that. So we do not create the right atmosphere back home. So the first thing is create the right atmosphere. The most important contribution to create the right atmosphere is a no love, a, a no fear environment, a no fear love environment. The Bible says there is no fear in love. And then unfortunately, we have to teach so many fathers on how to love. Because we in life, we do not differentiate between self-love and real love. And self-love is when you give to get. That is a business deal. That is contractual love. So you never give someone love to get something from the person. And I hope that husbands will remember this with their spouses. The other one is if you expect a person to live up to performance, to perform, to live up to your expectations, and then you will love them. This is also self-love because it's all about you. The real love, that, because expectations create fear. Because people must perform, they disappoint, and if not, guilt and shame is on their shoulders, and that creates a fear environment. The real love, the only real love, is a one-dimensional, uh, one-directional, unconditional love, which is not about getting, but to optimize the other person. Please make sure that you understand the difference between self-love and real love, and that you will serve everyone in the home with real love. First one is environment, the need of emotional stability. Number two, the need for moral authority. Children need to know the, what is right and what is wrong and how distinguish, uh, to distinguish this. Therefore, morality is to know the, to what is the right thing at the right time for the right reason. Moral authority comes through that. When I understand that life is not about me, when I give God a little room in my life, life is actually about God and where I fit into his purposes in life. It is God working towards intended purposes. And I am just one of the people that must help him to establish those purposes. I fit into God. I am not the sun. Uh, I am a planet evolving around the sun. God is the center, the moral compass for my life. And number three, children need affirmation. Affirmation. To form a good self with concept, and the father provides that. Affirmation is a much stronger educator than correction. And I wish my dad knew that. Then I would not question myself so much in life. But please... If you can try and find anything that your child is doing well, please affirm him or her immediately. Look at this father. Say, I am strong. I am strong. Say, I am smart. I am smart. Say, I work hard. I work hard. I am beautiful. I am beautiful. I am respectful. I am respectful. Yes. Say, 
I'm not better than anyone. I'm not better than anyone. Nobody's better than me. No one's better than me. I am amazing. I am amazing. I am great. I am great. What's your name? Aaliyah Austin. If you fall? I get back up. What are you? I'm less. Now, can you imagine? I want you to think back when you were a small boy or a small girl that your father would start every day with you like that. What difference would that have made in life even up to now? We encourage that there are also two specific, what we call rites of passages, specific ceremonies where you launch your child from childhood to teenager years, from the teenager years to adulthood. And please make sure that you know how to really affirm your child and launch your child to the next phase in life. The last one, children need clear identity, uh, which the fathers must confer. And therefore, to help them with their identity, it is absolutely essential that they surround themselves with the right people. We have a concept called uh, the table of support. 10 chairs of people sitting around the table of your life, supporting you in life, of which the following are the most important. Mentor, the mentee, the person whom you mentor, and the two inner circle friends, helping you, keeping you accountable, helping you to optimize in life. People around you are absolutely essential. And specifically, when your children are teenagers, then you've got to surround them with the right people. The next thing that every family should have is a family crest, a coat of arms. If we do not have it, they will adopt the one on my left-hand side, which is money, success, sex, and cell phone as the dominant values of life. Instead of that, you've got to choose others. On my right-hand side, this one says spiritual growth, helping people be enriched by international, uh, the international environment and being an, a, an, a supernatural person born from heaven visiting earth so that they adopt different values. These are the values of my family so that their life is gauged by these values. We don't make any decision unless we go to our primary values first. That determines how we spend our time, our money, and our discussions. I close with this quick story to inspire you to have the right values. And just please remember these four things that are essential in life. Emotional security, moral authority, the centrality of the Bible, moral authority, and then, or your Facebook then, if you're not a Christian. And then the third one is that uh, identity uh, and affirmation, the four important things that you have to do. Let's close quickly with a story. Many years ago, because our value is serving the poor children, it was shortly before Christmas that we decided this Christmas, we are not going to buy each other a present, but we're going to buy the present for the poorest three kids in the town, the same age and gender as my children. As we took them to the shop, my son came running up to me and said, dad, I need more money. I said, George, why? He said, dad, because his friend bought himself a doll. My mind was so confused, an 11 year old boy buying himself a doll. I said, George, why did he buy himself a doll? And then this George said, dad, I didn't know. So I asked him, I said, what did he say? He said, dad, he bought a doll for his sister back home. The first time ever for this poor boy to buy himself a new gift. And he did not think of himself. He thought of others, the right value in life. Changed the life of my son. Three years ago, my son phoned me, dad, can I buy a house for my friend? I said, George, but you don't have a house. Why would you buy a house for your friend? And then my son responded, dad, is this important to buy yourself a house before you buy a house for your friend? Can you see what happens if you establish the right values in the lives of your children? May God bless you with addressing these four essential needs in specific ages, but right throughout the lives of your children. Emotional security, absolutely essential. Moral authority, and then that 
identity and affirmation. And if you focus on that, you will become the father that you have aspired to be. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, thank you, Gregory. Thank you so much, Cassie. And to all our viewers that are watching once again all over the world, thank you for messaging us. We've seen that there are people watching from Japan, from mm -hmm. India, from Singapore. Thank you so much to all those that are, are reaching out and, and engaging us. Please, please do message us so that we know where you're watching from and also the questions you have. Um, we have a specific person you can send the questions to in the Zoom chat, Jeremy Graves. Please, please send the questions to that name so that we see it. Mm -hmm. For now, Cassie, that was excellent. Thank you so much. So you know, I, yeah. I wanted to ask you one question before we carry on. And after we hear the second speaker, there will be a, a whole other set of questions for, for all of you as a panel. So please stay on for that, Cassie. But for now, you know, we've heard you speak before and I've been extremely changed by the many things you've shared. Those four things you shared that are so crucial, you talked about emotional stability, the moral compass, affirmation and identity. In your experience, as we kind of warm up the people watching us, which one has been the most important of the four? Uh, I'm 100% sure that uh, the love environment, that selfless love environment is by far the best. So if someone says to me, no, you, too many, give me one. What is the one thing? I think a father demonstrates and trains the children on how to love selflessly. And then not only will the home change, but the whole world will change, I believe. That is wonderful. I see my wife smiling and looking at me. <laughs> For a reason, I think she's hinting. Thank you, Cassie. Once again, we're going to be asking more questions of you. In the meantime, let's uh, carry on with the speakers. Professor Slayton, we want to welcome you back on. Cassie, that was wonderful. I remember now so much of that stuff I, I read in your book, and I loved it, and I actually repeated some of it in, in, in Be a Better Dad today. And the love environment, so important, so wonderful. You know, I, we have a lot of friends from the Philippines on, and the next speaker is somebody you all know. And I just, I speak a little Tagalog, so I just want to use my favorite Filip Filipino word, kagilagilalas. And that's what I think about Pastor Peter Tanshi. He is a fabulous uh, a role model for me, really, as he was a successful businessman. He's a great father, a faithful husband, great community leader. But he felt the call of the Lord to found a church with his wife, which has now grown to be one of the biggest and most impactful churches in all of the Philippines. And by the way, if anyone is on this call and you're from the Philippines and you're thinking, yeah, I really need to get involved with a church. First of all, excellent idea. Second of all, Christ Commission Fellowship is a fabulous idea. There's lots of great churches and, and we're not here just to say one or the other but it is very good to be involved with the faith community. And we are so thankful to have Peter Tanchi here. Let me give a shout out to our Chinese listeners and our Japanese listeners. It's the first time we've ever done a Japanese track. So arigato gozaimasu to everyone who's listening in Japanese. And of course, to all our dear Chinese listeners, we say thank you so much. Now, Peter, it's a great honor and a privilege to have you on. I know that's... Uh, that's a big challenge following Casey, but I'm so glad we got you because I know you're going to do a wonderful job. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you for all you're doing for fathers and families, not just in the Philippines, but around the world. Over to you, Peter. And thank you so much. Thank you. Well, Cassie, uh, it's always a blessing to listen to you. And of course, Ambassador Slayton, thank you for inviting us. And uh, before I begin, I'd like to share with all of you why I'm really passionate about family, the importance of family. But first, let me show you a picture of my own family. I have five wonderful children. And here they are, two boys, three girls. And by the grace of God, they are all happily married. And here is the picture. So happily married, and because they love the Lord, they obey the Bible, go and multiply. And I will now show you the Tanchi family tree. I have 21 grandchildren, 
And by the grace of God, they not only multiply physically, but all my children are involved in ministry, discipleship, and our grandchildren are also involved. Uh, just today, my grandsons, grandsons, you know this plural, was sharing with me, one of them shared with me, they were all involved in an experimentation of a church worship service based on a group of small group people and uh, around 700 of them had a Saturday service and we had Sunday school and my grandson said, Ankong, grandfather, I facilitated a group and I led three of them to Jesus. This is amazing. My grandson is only around, I think, uh, 13, 14 years old. And the older grandson was also involved. So this is why I believe family is so important because the family is really under attack. Ladies and gentlemen, you may not realize this, but 80% of teenagers do not go back to church. In the Philippines, three out of, one out of three, in other words, around 32% are all already they are already involved in premarital sex this is scary one out of three ages below 19 are already involved in sex not only that addiction to pornography drugs and worst of all the suicide rate now i'm not just talking about the philippines this is worldwide okay especially america the number, the second leading cause of death between 15 to age 24 is suicide. Just think about it. 20% of all high school students in the States, because they gather a lot of statistics, have contemplated suicide. And almost 10% of these teenagers below 24 to 15 have attempted suicide. Suicide is the fourth leading cause of death in the whole world between ages 15 to 29. This is based on 2019 statistics. So when Kashi talks about the importance of giving them emotional security, he is absolutely on the spot. You may not realize this, but a Swedish study concluded about that the conclusion is the influence of a father when it comes to spiritual things is greater than the influence of a mother. This will shock you. For example, if both father and mother attend church regularly, 33% of their children will continue going to church. If father do not attend regularly, but mother attends, do you know how many percent of their children will continue going to church when they become adult, only 3%. If father is not attending, but the mother is regularly attending, only 2% will continue going to church. If father regularly attends worship service and mother do not regularly attend, guess how many percent of teenagers will continue going to church? 38%. Now, this is what is shocking. If the mother do not go to church, but the father, only the father, goes to church, how many percent of children will continue attending church when they're adults? 44%. What this statistics is telling me is the importance of father. So my topic today is becoming an effective father. And the verse I want to share with you is found in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. Let me read for you. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Let me explain to you the implication of this verse. How can you become an effective father? It tells you, do not provoke your children to anger. Grammatically, the Bible is telling us, the Apostle Paul is telling the fathers, stop provoking your children. In other words, the children are already being provoked. This is the same idea in Colossians chapter 3, 
verse 21. It says, fathers, do not exasperate your children, meaning they are already exasperating their children. How do you provoke? How do you exasperate your children? I'm going to share with you what are the reasons and what is the antidote when it comes to stop provoking, stop discouraging, stop exasperating your children. Now, notice the command in Ephesians 6.4. Bring them up. That's the word for nourish them. It's like applying fertilizer. Bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Grammatically, it's in the present tense, meaning you keep on nourishing your children. A positive environment as what Kashi has shared with us. Do you understand why this is, these principles are so important? Let me share with you how we provoke our children, how we exasperate children. Hypocrisy is number one. When father says something and they act differently, outside and inside the house, that's called hypocrisy, and children are exasperated. They lose heart. Another way that fathers exasperate their children or provoke their children is not fulfilling promises. You commit to do something and you don't do it. It's called an integrity problem. Not listening. When fathers are so busy and they don't listen, they become judgmental, they are critical before listening, that will exasperate your children. That will provoke your children. And lack of appreciation, too critical and over controlling. This is how we provoke our children. So what's the antidote? I want to give you three important principles. The antidote so that you don't provoke, you don't exasperate, and you and your children do not lose heart. What are the three principles? I call them MRI. What is MRI? MRI is an equipment to examine the body. It's like x-ray, but it's magnetic resonance imaging. Spiritually, how do you handle the heart of your children that they don't lose heart? I call this heart parenting, becoming an effective father. M stands for modeling. R it stands for relationship. I, it stands for intentionality. Three important principles. Why is it important? If you want to avoid exasperating your children, you better practice good modeling. So what is the principle of modeling? Very simple. Modeling is this, children copy us positively or negatively. The Bible is very clear. First Corinthians 11.1. Be imitators of me as I also am of Christ. The best way to encourage your children, look at your modeling. You want to teach them love? Model love. Why? Values are caught, not taught. Remember this, fathers. They are caught, not taught. They see you. Now, when I talk about modeling, I'm talking about modeling is about authenticity, not perfection. So it is important that you understand you need to be intentional in modeling. Example, what do you model? I suggest admit your failures. That's why you model humility. Apologize when you make a mistake. You model authenticity. Remember, hypocrisy is one of the number one reasons why teenagers stop going to church, why they do not copy the values of their parents. Model, what do you model? Model character, Christ likeness. Model, how do you handle stress? All right? So what I want you to hear, the importance of modeling, my daughter, I've requested her to share a short testimony on the principle of modeling. So let us see and hear the testimony of my daughter, Joy, and Edric. What impacted me with my parents as well is that they were the best versions of themselves. 
at home mm. with us. Yes. And, I you know, I would see that. them up on the pulpit, especially my father. And when he would preach, I really believed in what he said, not just because it was from the word of God, but because I saw that he lived the things that he talked about mm. at home mm. consistently. So that really blessed me. And I also have my own story. We, we were going to St. Luke's QC because my friend had asked for her father to be prayed over because he was very sick. So I convinced my dad. He was very busy. It was rush hour. I convinced him to go all the way to St. Luke's QC. And when we got there, it was the wrong hospital. <laughs> and I wanted I to react, so, right? I was so embarrassed. Mm. And I felt so a little bit nervous because I knew dad was so busy. But, you know, he didn't react at all. He was so calm about it. And he said, it's okay. And he still this went with me to St. Luke's BGC system. to pray with my friend's dad and share the gospel. You know, moments like that really impacted me. And this, it, I would say the same about my mom. She was just a consistently joyful yeah, person. Mom, predictably mom, joyful. Mom, mom even said, that's great. We have more time with each other. Right? That's right. <laughs> she said that. During that. That's right. My so mom you're talking did about say, mom. Yeah, we Go have ahead. more time with each other. So that's the kind of person she was, right? She would, she would respond mm. positively to circumstances, even difficult situations. And, and so growing up, even though we were also homeschooled for a bit, I don't ever remember her yelling at us, getting really irritated with us. And, you know, there have been times that I've struggled with that with my own children. And I remember my mom's example because I want my, my children to remember the same thing about me, that I choose to be a happy person, not because of me, but because of the Lord. And because by God's grace, I saw that in my, in my mom. I also remember that my mom role modeled to me what it really means to be a, a submissive wife, a wife who honors her husband. And so I also remember that when I'm relating to Edric and I'm struggling, right? I remember some weeks ago during the, during the quarantine, we were exercising as a family and I didn't like the exercises that Edric was making us do. So I was challenging him. I was, I was saying, you know, I'm not going to do it that way. I'm going to do my own thing. Not and my smiling, children, my children were watching. And so during the breakfast table afterwards, my oldest son said, you know, mom, when you are contradictory towards dad, when you challenge him in front of us, honestly, mom, it makes me feel like I can do the same thing. So I really was convicted by that because the truth is our kids are always watching mm -hmm. us. And so the good things, the bad things, they will copy. So I really had to apologize and ask for his forgiveness. And I think Edge is going to close with that. The importance of, you know, modeling authenticity and humility to our children. Yeah. So. The power in modeling is not just that it is something that we do more than what we say, but also when we mess up, we need to fess up, right? We like to say when we mess up, we fess up, meaning we humble ourselves to ask for forgiveness because we know that we want to model Christ's likeness. And because we are imperfect, when we do mess up, we need to find a way to remedy that so that our children do not think we are hypocrites and instead they think we are authentic. And obviously, as we ask for forgiveness and desire to change, we need to show that we actually do the change. This is something we wanted to share from our hearts. Praise God. So, fellow fathers and all of you who are listening, how do you apply this? I want you to ask the three questions you and your wife or your family members should ask. Number one, what do you need to stop doing? We're talking about modeling. Okay? In terms of modeling, are you a good model? What do you need to stop doing? Example, are you losing your temper? Do you shout? What do you need to stop doing? Number two, what do you need to start doing? Do you show your children the importance of regular Bible study, quiet time, sharing the gospel? What do you need to start doing to show them? You have to be intentional about modeling. And lastly, what do you need to continue doing? So consider this practical application. What do you need to stop doing? Your children are watching you. What do you need to start doing? to encourage them. And lastly, what do you need to continue doing? My wife came up with this beautiful statement. It says something like this. You must be what you want your children to be because they will become what you are. Principle number two, relationship. What do we mean by relationship? To overcome exasperation, provoking your children, inspiring them to be all that God wants them to be, be a good model, remember modeling, and number two, M, R, stands for relationship. This is the law of relationship. The closer the relationship, the greater the influence. That's why the Bible tells us, do not be deceived, bad company corrupts good morals. This verse tells us the power of relationship. The closer the relationship, the greater the influence. 
Just because you are the father does not automatically mean you have influence. So my question is this. I like what Dr. Newfield said. A foremost child developmental and clinical psychologist. When did your child fall in love with you? If you do not have their hearts, you will not have their minds. Fathers, when did your child fall in love with you? This is my prayer for all fathers. Are you learning how to win the heart of your children? I praise God that our five children we have all fallen in love with each other. Remember, rules without relationship leads to rebellion. Truth without relationship leads to rejection. Quality of relationship determines the weight of influence. So may I share with you, in case you have bad relationship or your relationship is not good with your children, here are my humble suggestions. Number one, I would suggest consider spending time having good communication. You know why? You need to be intentional in building relationships. It is not automatic. Are you spending time? Do you have good communication? Build good memories. Remember, time is a function of priority. Don't say you are too busy. Because priority determines whether you have time or you don't have time. If you don't have time for something, it simply means it is not your priority. Now, how do you restore relationship? If you have problems with your children or they are grown up already and you have messed up, I suggest the three most important questions that you can develop and practice to restore broken relationship, wounded spirit, how do you restore it? Number one question you ask them is this. How can I improve? Listen and don't react. Everybody, can you repeat that phrase with me? How can I improve? Listen and don't answer, don't react. Number two, how have I hurt you? Keep quiet and listen. Don't defend. Number three, will you forgive me? I want you to practice this when you go home with your loved ones, with anybody. This is how you restore relationship. You give them a chance to speak up. If they are silent, don't force them to answer you. Your attitude should really be one of humility. Be patient. No perfect father. No perfect parents. So be willing to say, how can I improve? Be prayerful. Ask for forgiveness. I want you to hear a testimony of one of my sons regarding the importance of being intentional, developing relationship, intimacy with your children. Let's hear my son, Paul. You know, yesterday my daughter asked me, Dad, are you going to work from home again? And I said, yes, I am. And she said, great, yes. And I asked her, oh, why, why did you ask? And do you like it when I work at home? She said, yes, I love it. Just her wanting me to be at home, um, it, it really opens up the doors for an intimate relationship. If you want to develop intimate relationships with your disciples or with your parents or with your children, you just want to be with them. And that's what I felt growing up. I knew my parents wanted to be with me. And even today, they's like, oh, you know, uh, we wish we could be with the favorite people in our lives. Um, and they say that constantly. And so affirming that you want to be with the people you want to develop intimacy with means so much to them. And the second element is, is really cultivating uh, an environment of trust. Mm -hmm. And I, I felt that growing up. I could trust my parents with, with anything. It was their authenticity. You know, they, they were consistently joyful. I didn't have to guess, is dad and mom going to be in a good mood today? They were consistent. And they were consistent as human beings. They were consistently following Christ at the pulpit at the office, at home, they were the same person. And so when I struggled with pornography, I could tell my dad and I could tell my mom, and they really helped me through that journey. They brought the computers out into the living room so that um, you know everybody could see what you were looking at. And so you know, both of us coming from um, 
great families, um, you would think that we would be great parents. And, and <laughs> we, we were at a parenting um, or a family retreat, and the exercise was to ask your children, um, how have we hurt you? And in my mind, I was like, easy answer. Um, we haven't hurt our kids. <laughs> so I asked our kids, we were on the table, and I remember vividly, I said, how has daddy hurt you? And to my shock, all of them started to cry. I, my kids now are 15 year old. Um, I have four kids, a 15 year old, all the way down to a six year old. And each of them had a specific example of how I had hurt them. And that's a great question to, to ask um, your children, your parents, your disciples. How have I hurt you? And as they share with you and open up, listen to them, which is what we did. And then we apologize. I, I apologize. I had hurt them uh, more than Jenny had. And, um, you know, that's what God does when you come before Him with humility and the power of His Holy Spirit. He, he opens the doors to rebuild intimacy. You know, Jesus is the one that modeled intimacy uh, for us, right? He broke down all the barriers when He died on the cross to pay for our sin. And because of what He's done in my life, I realize it's important for you and I to constantly reach out to people. And when you express interest in people's lives, and create an environment of trust that develops intimacy. Thank you, Paul. Praise God that it is never too late to help restore relationship when you're willing to humble yourself. So what are the three principles? Modeling, M, R. R is what? Relationship, develop intimacy, build relationship, love relationship, and lastly, intentionality. By the way, uh, everything I'm sharing, this is a shortened version of a book that my wife had written. It's called Motivate. Motivate was written precisely for fathers and for mothers for parenting. This is eight principles. M, modeling, motivate. O, obedience. T, spending time. I, intimacy. V, vision, A, affirmation, T, train them, teach them, E, and trust them to God. By the way, uh, these books are expanded version, and uh, there are question and answer, and I don't get money out of this. This is all uh, going to be used for the ministry, and uh, we try to make it as reasonable as possible, so feel free to get this book. It's a shortened version. It's expanded version. So the last principle I want to share with you is called intentionality. What does it mean? The law of intentionality is good results seldom happen by chance. They are a byproduct of intentionality. Train up a child in the way he should go. When he is old, he will not depart from it. That word train is a very interesting Hebrew word. It is like you whet the appetite of a child. It's like training a wild horse. A horse is useless until you learn to break the will of the horse, but not the spirit of the horse. So that's why you have to be intentional in modeling, intentional in developing relationship, and intentional in training your children. One intentional act will accomplish more than a thousand hopes and dreams. Why is it very important to be intentional? What do I mean by intentional? Everything you do with your children, you have to think through. Am I intentional in modeling? Am I intentional in building relationship? This one I want to share with many fathers. Be intentional in casting vision. Vision gives direction in one's life. The clearer and grander the vision, the greater is the motivation. Are you giving your children a vision of what they can become, what God wants them to become in their lives? Because vision gives direction. Many young people have no vision. They don't see what God wants them to become. May I advise all fathers, help develop a godly vision for your children because the greater the clearer the vision, the greater is the motivation for your children to discipline themselves to be all that God wants them to be. The last verse I want to share with you is Ephesians 2.10. We are his workmanship 
created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is God's vision for us. God created us for a reason, for a purpose. God saved us. We are his workmanship. Notice Ephesians 2.10 is after Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Many of you are familiar with 8 and 9, how we are saved by grace through faith. But most of us don't emphasize verse 10. We are his workmanship. That word workmanship is from the word poema, poem. You are God's masterpiece. Tell your children they are God's masterpiece. God has a great plan for them. And God has God wants them to be all that he wants them to be. So my question to all of you is this. Do you have a vision for your marriage? Do you have a vision for your family, for your children? Think about it. I want you to pray. Ask yourself, 10, 20 years from now, what do you like your family to be? Let me share with you my own vision statement for our family. Here is my vision statement for family. And I pray that you come up with your vision statement for us to see my children loving and serving the Lord. My vision for our family, to see my children passing on a godly heritage to their children and their children's children. In other words, spiritual heritage. To see my children discipling others in fulfilling the Great Commission. Lastly, to hear God say to all of us, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master. That is our family vision, and I pray that you have your own family vision. Be intentional. So how can you become effective parents? Modeling. Be a good model. Our relationship. Intentional in building relationship. And lastly, be intentional. Thank you, uh, mm -hmm. Pastor Peter. Uh, or should we say that? Uh, go ahead, Professor Slayton. No, I just wanted to say just wonderful, Cassie and Peter. I'm taking notes here myself. And Peter, you talked about vision. And in my book, which has by God's grace become a global bestseller with over a million copies sold worldwide, I talk a lot about the noble family vision. So exactly, Peter, what you're talking about, so important to cast a vision so our children can see everything that they can become. That's exciting. Thank you so much, Pastor Peter. Back over to you, Edric and Joy. No, thank you for a I think Joy has an opening question for uh, her dad or dad. Yeah. As we warm up and start fielding the questions to all of you panelists. Again, Cassie, thank you for being back on the call. Professor Slayton, it's awesome to have you here in the panel. Go ahead, Ben. Yeah, we have a great question actually from the audience, a very honest one. And dad, I'm directing this towards you. When you mentioned those three questions, how can I improve? How have I hurt you? will you forgive me? One of the attendees said, what if my children don't want to answer those questions? What do I do? Remember what I said? Patient. Be patient. Don't force them. I remember asking that to, uh, to your eldest brother years ago. And I uh, remained silent for a while. And I was shocked. He was already 30 years old. And he forgot I asked this question when he was younger, right? But because he left for the States to study his master. And before he got married, remember, I, I, I was driving with him in the car and I asked him the same questions again. This, By the way, these three set of questions, I ask them every year with each of my kids. How can I improve? How have I hurt you? Will you forgive me? And of course, uh, I don't know if you remember, Joy, he began to cry. And I began to cry, but I don't force him to speak up. So be patient. That's my advice. Be patient. And in due time, you may be surprised your own children, your own child will also ask you, what about me, dad? How can I improve? Now, if they don't ask you, don't force them to ask you. And I think, you know what, since you premised it with modeling and relationship building, if those two things are in place, then it 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 gives way to have those open, you know, open, that open communication because 
you're healing a lot of the father wounds that Cassie was referring to when you model properly and you do build relationship with your kids. So Han, did you want to start up with yes, some of the other questions? Yes, we do. We have some, a lot of other questions. We just want to remind everyone that's watching here, a number of people have been asking, can we get copies of the past episodes? Where mm -hmm. can we find these things? Please look up the YouTube channels of Family First, as well as the Facebook page, just so that you can catch those and even this later on. So I think, I think, can I add something? Please. Uh, <laughs> They may not realize this. It took me 40 years to write that book. You know why I waited for 40 years? Because I waited until Joy and you can become co-authors. I wanted to see if the biblical principles and application really work in the family. And I waited to see if it will work in your life. And now remember, even your son contributed to the book. So this is a unique book, written not by the father only, not by the mother only, but by my children and the in-laws and the grandchildren. So uh, I just thought, Joy, you have an amazing uh, chapters article there. Uh, so I, I wanted them to know you are a wonderful daughter and a wonderful son-in-law. Oh, thank you. You're thank you. With you're Cassie. Which is a great Told segue. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great segue. So should I have a mirror and say, right. I am great. I am amazing. I so, <laughs> you know, uh, Cassie, there's a question that we'd like to feel to all the dads that are on this call in this panel right now, but we want you to open with this. It's from um, a, a viewer from Japan, actually, now Silwinski saying, what about someone who's broken? Can you help give tips on repairing, for example, you, you talked about how powerful affirmation is, but when you lose it with your child, mm. what do you do? Yeah, let me frame it a little bit broader. I think many questions are always related to restoration, either a, a relationship with children that gone uh, went wrong or a relationship with dad that did not go well. And then general restoration, how can I get out of this? So firstly, to the dad. Now, Peter helped very well there, but I want to add something to that. And that is sometimes children do not know on how we hurt them. They don't have the words. It is a subconscious thing that they don't find words for. So I want to encourage all dads to get training on how you can really hurt your child by neglect, not by doing things wrong, but by leaving out what you should have done. And that could be an eternal scar on his life so so please find that out and then when you ask them for forgiveness there is a specific way in which we should ask forgiveness otherwise the children would never believe and i wish i had the time to unpack that to you but please train yourself on how to ask forgiveness that children will really believe that you are sorry and then with your dad if you walk with a scar there are we always say there are four absolutely vital things in that Firstly, own the problem, not shame or blame, but own the problem. You have the problem. Secondly, you've got to forgive. Forgiveness unlocks many things from God, but also between us and others. And then you've got to find a way of having inner victory. We have a whole course for people over a weekend to find from victim to victor, to find inner victory by replacing the lies of Satan that you live by and that groove actually your neural pathways to exchange that for a new pathway, a new way of thinking, to exchange the lie for the truth and act on the truth. So, so that you've got to be trained in. And then the last one, you cannot do it alone. You've got to walk together. So that's just a framework of how to get restoration. But the big, big, big thing is we attend motivational seminars on parenting, on fathering, and so on. Motivational seminars are not enough. Motivation is not enough. Information is needed. And we have a 24-hour training, and that's the shortest we can do it in, to give people information to understand many more things. And I want to encourage everyone to go for a more extensive training to get all the information and all the understanding before restoration comes. It is not a microwave thing, a quick fix. Sorry, I did the mistake. Forgive me, please. So, okay, dad, I forgive you and carry on. That is simplifying the whole issue. It is a lifelong restoration process because you have a scar, you have lost emotionally a hand or a leg, and you have to learn to live with the scar in a victorious way to overcome. Thank you, Cassie. Wonderful tips. Uh, Professor Sladen, there's a question here that talks about pressure. 
Can you address that? These specific questions. How do I avoid putting pressure on kids? You know, and it sounds quite broad. There may even be a good side and a bad side to it. Let's hear your thoughts. No, thank you very much. And uh, let me again say thanks to, to everybody. This has been wonderful. Uh, many of us um, grew up in families like achievement-oriented families. And even though my father left me early, left completely disappeared and wrote us a letter, boys, I'm leaving. I never want to hear from you again. I never want to see you again. I never want to have anything to do with, the, with you for the rest of your life. So that left a super deep father's heart wound. And I really appreciate Cassie speaking of that because that's not something you get over in a week or a month or a year or even decades. You gotta keep working at that. So number one, all families, all of us are broken. I just want to encourage you guys because there might be some fathers saying, I can't do it. I've made so many mistakes. Let me tell you, brother, you're still alive. So there's a chance for restoration. It's going to take time, as Peter and Cassie said, but there's a chance. Now, Edward, to your question on pressure, that's a really good question. And, you know, I believe that we have to have clear and reasonable expectations for our children, even when they're young. I think one of the big problems today is that kids who are growing up in upper class families or, you know, wealthy families, they got maids running around. They're, you know, nothing to do, right? I think it's important that kids know you got to clean your room, you got to do your homework, you got to help with the dishes, stuff like that. Later on, you know, we, we've been blessed. We have kids at Harvard and, and all the finest schools. But I think it's important that we keep in mind preparing our children for heaven and not for Harvard. You know, if they want to go to Harvard and they can do that or wherever, it doesn't matter, you beat Diddy or whatever, that's great. But we have to remember that it's whatever God wants for them. That's why I love Peter's talking about the vision. You know, maybe for some of our kids, the vision is not to go to a, you know, do a PhD at Stanford or whatever. That's fine. Whatever God's vision is for them, that's what we have to discover. And that's what we have to help them to discover. Can I, um, can I chime in there? Go for it. I think, um, especially when it comes to... Uh, Chinese family or Asian family, where there's a lot of expectations when it comes to school grading. Uh, my advice is I, I can only share with you what we did in our family where we never pressured our children to act in a certain way because I am a pastor. They don't even know that I'm a pastor. They don't even understand that term, why? Because the pressure should never be for you to look good. The, what you and I want to do is what's good for our children. So I only ask them one question every time they give me the report cards. Have you done your best? If they say they've done their best, that's finished. And by the grace of God, I have to be the one to tell them, stop studying. I mean, my children are all achiever. They, they were all top in their classes. But not pressured because that is not what I focus on. I just focus on their character, doing your best for Jesus. So I think it's so crucial that we watch our language, our tone, and the way we interact with them. And thank you so much. That those are all such helpful tips. And I, I, I concur with what uh, Professor Slayton was saying that there's always hope, right? And I think that this is why there is this seminar. And there is a question here also. It's a very interesting question because now it's from the perspective of a son. He wants to rebuild his relationship with his father, even though his needs have not been met, but he wants to initiate. So maybe let's open this up for anybody who wants to answer it. But how would you encourage him and how would you advise him to go about this? As a son, how could I rebuild my relationship with my dad when most of my needs are not being met by him? Maybe we can start with Cassie. Oh, I'll try and do it short. The first thing is obviously in your own heart, there must be that forgiveness. And forgiveness you get from the cross, understanding how Christ forgave you and that forgiveness flows to your dad. If it's not in your own heart, you will never rebuild. So in your own heart, that forgiveness must be there. The second thing, if you want to approach your father, it is not good to approach, approach him with the blame. 
and say, you've done this wrong and this wrong and this wrong. The best way to approach him is, Dad, I want to thank you for this and this and this and this. And secondly, Dad, for this part of life that we are left with, I want to learn from you. And, and could, could I spend more time with you so that I can learn from you? And when that relationship is built in a positive way, then it will open a time where you say, Dad, you know what? There was a time that you really hurt me by this. I have forgiven you for this, Dad. So I, don't, I just want you to know that you are free. You don't owe me anything. I just want to focus on what I can learn from you. I think our problem is often that we start with the blame process. And then at the same time, we want to rebuild that because we feel that Dad owes us something right off the debt and on a clean slate build on the good things that you have learned and can learn from that. And then gradually you can enter into the more hurtful things in your life. That, that's beautiful. And you know what? I, we are getting flooded with more questions. Unfortunately, um, we want to keep it tight. There's been a lot of information, a lot of amazing content. And once again, to all those watching, you will get copies of this. Uh, as we wind down with all the dads here, we want to ask you a closing question. Again, we wish we had more time. Or we're going to wind it down. Um, the question is, what are your parting thoughts after your own experience as a father and the things that you've shared? Mm -hmm. Any parting thoughts? Let's keep it tight. It's about max three minutes. Uh, Professor Sladen, would you like to start off? Well, I would love to, Hendrik. And, and again, I just want to encourage my fellow fathers and moms out there that no matter what's happened, no matter how good a dad or a mom you are, or maybe you haven't quite hit the mark. Guys, we can be better dads, better moms starting today. But it's not just, just like Cassie said, it's not just about kind of, okay, I'm going to encourage myself. We need the information. We need mentors. We need partners. And that's why Family First Global exists. We exist just like Cassie. We work a lot with World Needs of Father. We're going to work more closely with love, love those guys. And we already work very close with Price Commission Fellowship. Our lead, one of our leaders in the Philippines is from that church. It's a fantastic church. So we want to work together with organizations around the world to encourage fathers and mothers to get more encouragement, information, because we need other moms and other dads who are encouraging us to do the right thing, to be better moms and dads ourselves, and we can. Let me just close with this. I've had the great privilege in life of being a US ambassador, a Silicon Valley venture capitalist, and Ivy League professor, all by God's grace. But let me tell you guys, every one of those jobs either has come to an end or will come to an end. And that's the very same thing for every single guy in this call. What job never comes to an end is the job of father. And if you do a good job, just like Cassie and Peter, you get promoted to granddad, right? No better job in the world, no greater benefits in the world. And let me tell you this, no more impactful opportunity. You know, I used to work for President Bush right, for quite a while, friend of mine. And he himself said, yeah, being president is a great opportunity, great role, but being a dad is even more important. So I just want everybody to go away with that, moms, dads, you are doing the most important job in the world, and we want to help you at Family First Global to do the best job you can. Let us know how we can help. We are a Christian nonprofit service organization. We want to serve and bless and help. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks to our speakers. Thanks to our interpreters in Chinese and Japanese. Thank you to Isaac TV broadcasting to millions in Pakistan and around the world. Thank you to everybody who joined us, our wonderful MCs. Love those guys. And uh, just thank you so much. It's been wonderful to be with you. And I myself have learned a ton. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Slayton. Uh, we'll now go to uh, Pastor Peter or Dad. And before you come up and say your parting words, Dad, thank you for being a great father, even to me. I know that, you know, Joy is really your daughter, but you have been a, an amazing father. And I just want to be able to say that publicly. You have helped change my life. I've seen a lot of these principles I heard from these gentlemen, and I'm grateful that you've applied it even to me. So thank you, Dad. Parting words from you, please. I believe a good father requires supernatural strength from the Lord. 
we cannot do it on our own. And that's why I would encourage all of us uh, begin with making sure that you are connected to Jesus yourself. If you are not filled with Jesus, if you are empty, you cannot give what you don't have. How can you love if you have not experienced God's love? How can you forgive if you have not experienced forgiveness? So everything begins with your personal relationship with the Lord. So intimacy with God cannot be fake. I am not asking you to pass on a religion. I'm asking you to really pass on the reality of Jesus Christ. Without Jesus, let me ask you, how will your children embrace those values living in a secular world? That's why you connect yourself to Jesus. You let your children connect to Jesus. And that means you live your life in such a way that it will encourage them to want to connect with Jesus. If you and I are hypocrites, they will turn away from Jesus. So my role is to help encourage my children through my life that, hey, Jesus is real, he loves me, and I will want Jesus. I think parenting at the end of the day is really about connecting with God, letting your children connect with God, and once they're connected with God, they will disciple others. So you and I know our ministry is built upon making disciples to make disciples. And once you see your children making disciples, and then you see your grandchildren discipling others. My friend, what greater joy can that be? Money cannot buy that. So I give all the credit and the glory to Jesus. And that means let us all be spirit-filled. No substitute for the Holy Spirit-filled life. Joy in the Lord. Every father should be full of joy because the spirit-filled life is a joyful life. Thank you, Dad. Pastor Peter. Finally, Cassie. In short, three things. Number one, best gift to children, love their mother. <laughs> Enough said on that one. Second one, uh, emotional intelligence is a much better thing for success in life than achievement of high marks at school. All research will tell you that. Last one, create a no fear environment because the brain and the child therefore optimizes in a no fear environment and the no fear environment is exactly that selfless sacrificial love that we learn from jesus and that is the way to live at home thank you so much you know i know that this is for fathers but i was convicted by many things that we listened to today and I, I like that no fear environment. And as I homeschool my kids, I have to be careful of that, right? I don't want to affect their brain for six hours negatively, as Cassie shared with us earlier. So I know you guys have enjoyed this. And I know that you guys are looking for more. And we all want more. But in the interest of time, we want to respect your time. So we want you guys to look forward to the next webinar, which is happening in September. So we want to invite all of you guys, stay tuned. Um, you know, get on the platforms of Family First Global and save the date in September. We're going to announce it soon. Follow the social so you can be aware of what's happening. Yeah, next. and it's yeah. all in the chat box. You're seeing this on whichever yeah. platform you're watching. Uh, we want to thank everybody for joining. And we have final poll for all of you that are on this Zoom, especially final poll. Help us find out how we can do things better. Ready, set, go. You see that on your screens. Do this quickly with us. Ready, go. Right, we'll give you 10 seconds to do this. 10, nine. And why is this super important? Because eight, I'm still counting. Yeah. Seven. We need to make sure that we keep improving, right? Family First Global really wants to make sure that it meets the needs of families and makes, you know, puts content out there that is really relevant. So when you do these polls, it's super helpful for them. Super helpful for them, super helpful for us. So amazing, guys. Thank you for doing that. I want to wrap up and say, hey, speakers, come back on. Professor Slayton. Thank you, everybody, for watching us. We will all now wave to you a wonderful goodbye. Please join us, speakers, Professor Slayton, as we wave goodbye to all the participants watching from all over the world. Thank you once again, everybody. Thank you to our speakers. Thank you to the team behind this. 
We've had a great time. We're looking forward to joining you at the next webinar. Say goodbye, everybody. Bye-bye.